Hello, welcome to Tub Talks. My special guest today is New Yorker, around the town, socialite, and researcher and PhD candidate, Alex Borsat. Hi, Damon. So happy to be here. I've seen this tub for so long. It's so good to be in it. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here because you, the time I've known you, the way you look at the world, the way you research in the world, the way you do your, the ethics with which you do your work, I find very inspiring. And I want to share that and talk about that. Thank you. Absolutely. But first I want to ask you. Yes. What you like most about your body. Oh boy. Yeah, absolutely. So I think for me, it's, it's gotta be my butt, you know? I think it's like the face and the butt are the two things I bring to the table. Uh -huh. um, but you know, especially, I think for me, my body journey has involved a lot of weight fluctuations over the year, you know? I've been thick, I've been thin, I've been average, and I think throughout it all, I've always felt a, uh, a sense of security and joy in uh, having a butt that gets attention. That's great. And your butt does get attention. attention. Like if, you should, if you go out, if you're right. showing it. Now, do you feel pressure to be a certain weight or to look a certain way in the gay community today? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I think for me, you know, I'm sort of on the, uh, maybe the thicker end of my journey that I've been through mm -hmm. uh, over the years. And I've done a lot of work recently just uh, trying to deconstruct and pay more attention to diet culture and body norms in the gay community. And I think when I was a little bit younger and moved to New York, I was happier to comply with them and self-monitor and try and fit myself into a box. And I think recently I've begun trying to unpack that a little more and free myself from some of those norms. And you know, and I think while they are still very palpable, we're seeing a lot more people begin to really challenge them. And that's been really exciting to see. Yeah, so the diet culture you mentioned yeah. is this idea, or what I call a should. Yes. Right, that one should be fit. Right. Why? Great question. So, you know, I talked a little bit about this um, in a video I did with Sniffies, a yeah. popular new gay hookup yeah. and cruising app that I've been making uh, queer history content for. Wow. Um, and they asked me a bit, you know, to talk about sort of the history of the, the muscled body, the low body fat muscled body uh, in gay culture. And, you know, I think we saw the emergence of it around kind of the middle of the 20th century um, with the rise of these sort of... Uh, physical health magazines, which is, you know, sort of how gay content had to be branded in order to be allowed to circulate. Mm -hmm. So the image of the sort of muscled gay body queen uh, really sprang from that. And then I think through the height of the HIV crisis, um, as I'm sure you know, you know, having a thin body or non-muscled body kind of became a differently charged, you know, around people not wanting to appear to be sick. Mm. Um, and so there's been a lot of shifting over the years, but I think the rise of, you know, gay consumer culture as well, you yeah. know, the sort of rise of social media, the rise of LGBTQ oriented marketing. We've just seen a lot of things coalesce around a low body fat, uh, gay body, and especially one with muscles. Um, and so I think, uh, it's a hard time right now to, to be okay with your body in the gay community, but there's also been, like I said, you know, a really profound pushback. When, when did you start to notice that pushback becoming more culturally assimilated? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think um, in many ways, I think COVID kind of uh, started to unravel some of these norms for a lot of folks, just because with um, so many people having to change their daily rhythms, their daily lives, their access to sort of their normal forms of bodily maintenance, uh, people began to realize that there's kind of this whole song and dance and structure and machinery and everyday sort of routine that goes into trying to achieve some sort of body that we feel will make us loved or make us accepted. And I think a lot of people begin to see that bulwark and begin to realize that there are more important things and more important ways to be and to make community outside of just uh, maintaining a body that is uh, not authentic or natural or sort of grounded in internal, you know, right. sort of desire. And I think that really hits it on the head is what people are really after here. It's not necessarily the thinness, it's the love and the acceptance people are so hungry for. Absolutely. And you know, I think you see like, I've seen a lot of, you know, memes online of uh, people saying like the types of bodies I'm into and it's, you know, just like average guy, dad bod, you know, diverse sort of images, but then they'll make a joke about how they have to have, you know, that uh, low body fat, high muscle, magazine body. And like you said, I think it comes from a need to 
feel desire or acceptance or self-love more than it actually matters about the body itself. Yes, yes. And they just see that that limited twink image is the way, is the means to achieve the ends. Hopefully, and I really want to think and hope that we are changing that. I do think there was some change that came around about 10 years ago. Yeah. Once iPhones became available, once Scruff became available, once the mayor started establishing like cultural norms, I think there started to be more body positivity and acceptance and saying you can be loved, accepted, and greatly hungry and fucked a lot just by being you. Absolutely. But I know that the pressure, the thin, to the literal pressure to be less of who you are is still so salient because I hear that so much in my therapy office. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm sure in your your private practice, and this probably comes up with you a lot, but yeah, you know, I think the amplification that social media gives us, you know, is uh, complicated and elevates a lot of different types of ideas and voices. And while it makes this sort of visual economy of thinness or of normative bodies uh, more strong. It also gives people uh, like, you know, uh, who may be on the other end of body positivity or body neutrality or sort of like bear culture voices as well and can uh, introduce people to ideas and perspectives that they may not see. And, well. and bodies and curves and hair and beauty. Like, I see guys on Instagram all the time who aren't thin and, and really embrace the label of bear or daddy or whatever. I'm not even sure why we need labels. Right. right? <laughs> but if we have to go with labels, I see them getting like thousands of likes from people around the world when they show their hairy belly or when they show their hairy butt. And I think that's a beautiful thing. We didn't have that 30 years ago. Absolutely. There's definitely a, a sort of newfound style of uh, thick fluencers, which I'm not even sure that's the word. Oh, I like that. If that is a new word, though, I coined it. I have it. Okay, I'm yes. going to give you that because I haven't ever heard that, but I like it. And I'm probably now going to use it. Absolutely. So I will give you that credit. You heard it here on Bad Tub Talks first. Thick flu- Thick fluencers. Thick fluencers. We'll oh, I love that. Okay. So you, so you have gone the route in academia of doing research that very much has a social justice context to it. Tell me more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, in my earlier days of getting into queer research and health research, uh, as you know, I sort of started looking at PrEP, HIV prevention, and the really profound silences, which I'm sure you know, you can, I spoke to you about, um, in the early years, right around 2012, after it was FDA approved, where we had this incredible modality and almost no one was using it or knew about it. Um, and that's actually how I came across and met David, is I saw his fantastic work around awareness raising and uh, interviewed him for my research as, a, as an expert witness. Um, and so, you know, I think for me, you know, I started really as a... Uh, uh, sort of like biology kid, right? You know, I wanted to be a biologist like my mother and did benchtop research. And then I realized that it didn't capture the sort of lived human experience that I started to pay more attention to as I came into my own queerness. And so as I sort of, you know, got more into public health and the social ways that health and science Uh, are distributed throughout different populations. I think my queer political identity and my sort of public health research identity really were intertwined from the get-go. And earlier on, you know, I uh, really focused my work on PrEP, HIV prevention, and also linking folks to treatment. Um, And I've kind of expanded that recently to look even more at uh, the way that health and science and gender and sexuality interact. There's uh, so much there. There's so much going on there. (laughs) So when you started studying PrEP academically, yeah. it was at a time when very few of us were, were speaking about it. And your research started to, or, the, or your study started to outline what? Like, what was it that about that? that was yeah, that? yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think this is still... The crux of the issue, I think, is around the respectability of different types of sex. Um, And, you know, and I've seen you just speak in tons and tons of different environments to tons of different folks with tons of different uh, vocabularies even to get at this. Um, You know, I started that research around 2015, 2016, and I think around 2016 is when we maybe started to see 
an inflection point and a little bit more prep uptake. Yeah. But in the years before that, what I was hearing from so many people and what I know we both saw in Prep Facts, uh, your Facebook, 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 Facebook yeah, group yeah, yeah. for folks to discuss how to access prep in the years where it was much harder than it is now, yeah. um, was that physicians were reluctant and other providers were reluctant to prescribe it and didn't view the peace of mind and the safety and the sense of autonomy and empowerment that it could provide people to be worth the possible trade-off for risk compensation or for people having more sexual partners or feeling sexually liberated or making different choices around condoms or status discussions. And, and I think that fear and that lack of respect for other ways of being sexual um, really hindered on a population level the amount of prep that we got into the population and that people felt empowered to access and able to access. And I think it really slowed things down uh, in a way that's hard to capture. Do you feel like that's still partly why um, it's so low today? The rates of PrEP uptake are so low in the U.S. right now? Yeah, really good question. So the rates have increased over time, um, but still not where they could be. You know, I think a, a year or two before the pandemic, we had the figure that there is about 120,000 people in the U.S. on PrEP with a rough estimate that maybe 1.2 million could benefit from it, mm. which is, you know, a figure with a lot of asterisks added and caveats, but, you know, it gives us a good sense that this probably still isn't quite as accessible as it needs to be. Um, and I think the answer to whether that preoccupation with sexual risk and how people manage it, manage it is still at the heart of things, both yes and no. I think there are still folks, still healthcare providers, still individuals wondering if this is something they want, where that fear or that lack of uh, acceptance for what type of sex life they might want to have is a really big obstacle. That said, I think we've also seen uh, a normalization of PrEP that was not the case mm -hmm. eight, 10 years ago. You know, we see campaigns also marketing this uh, almost in the other way, saying it is the responsible sort of almost should, you know, coming up again and say, this is something you should be on if you have this type of sex, oh, which is almost an overcompensation, I think. Yeah, well, I don't think shoulds ever work in healthcare. It certainly didn't work when we were doing, and I say we, because I was part of this message, or the condom only message. Right. So telling people what they should be doing with their body doesn't work. I actually wrote about the condom message in yeah. my book because it wasn't working. And I think if people are going to take that mindset to prep or even to treatment, then we're just doing the same thing over and over again, over expecting again. different results. Absolutely. Right? And, and sometimes that looks like, you know, you shouldn't take this because it means that you are, you know, sexually irresponsible or sexually lascivious, or it can mean you should do PrEP because mm -hmm. you need this and you are at risk. And no matter what the should looks like, a should is almost never uh, the right way to go about it's it. It's not right? conducive, in my experience, to to change or, or to, to sustainable change. Just sometimes you can get short-term change. Yeah. You can get compliance with a should right. in the short term, but you really are not going to get people inspired to do it on their own when you're not looking or monitoring them if it's coming from a place of should. And I think Absolutely. that's true for drug treatment, for HIV prevention, for diabetes medications, cholesterol medications. It's just never going to work from my point of view Absolutely. if you're going to tell people what they should be doing with their body. But so you were doing research though, looking at these doctors um, who were sort of defining respectable sex. Yeah. The, and that's such an interesting, interesting thing. Like, you know, I remember some of the argument, are you comfortable? Oh, I'm okay. all good, never um, been comfortable. You know, there was the whole um, complaint about PrEP, like if you give people PrEP, they'll have recreational sex. Right. That was a real, that wasn't a doctor, but that was a gay celebrity. I. <laughs> <laughs> who didn't, who it's, you know, to this day has never taken that back, has never recounted that. So that just clued me in. I'm like, oh, wait, this is our own community discerning the the uh, recreational sex. And I'm like, I felt really bad for him because I don't know what kind of sex he's having <laughs> if he's not having recreational but if, sex. Right. If that's the kind of energy we're taking to it, though, then like, I don't know, girl. So, right, yeah. right. So it was that whole like anti pleasure movement. Yeah. And prep for me is all about pleasure. <laughs> that is the whole reason to take prep is to have, I mean, there's other reasons to take prep if one, not everyone's having sex for pleasure. Right. But a great lot of us who are using PrEP are having sex for the purpose of pleasure. For pleasure. And that PrEP allows us to do that. Right. And I think, you know, what we see is even with people who are essentially involved in the community, in LGBTQ health, in sort of gay social life, 
Um, you can still see the power of this really narrow biomedical thinking, mm -hmm. right? Like the that fear of pleasure or fear of people's desire to seek human connection uh, can still inspire people to speak against an incredible intervention or incredible resource that we have available. Yeah. Um, and it's wild, you know, because I think at the heart of queer politics is the need to liberate ourselves bodily, sexually, politically, economically, and to see the power that shame and judgment can have and uh, that a sort of pleasure phobia can have, yeah. even among people in the community. Is, yeah, uh, so do you think that's changing in academia and science? Do you think that anti-pleasure stance has shifted at all during the time that you've been doing research? Really great question. Yeah, so I think in uh, gender and sexuality studies right now, especially as it intersects with public health and HIV more broadly, um, we're seeing a centering of pleasure um, a lot more than we did in the past. And I think more voices have spoken up, kind of like you have, and kind of like we're talking here, uh, about how fear of pleasure and sexual autonomy hindered the progress we've made with PrEP and with ongoing sexual health and HIV uh, mm -hmm. treatment and prevention. And so there is a lot more focus on pleasure and empowerment now. Research is supporting this. We've shown that uh, you actually do get better health outcomes as well. And people are more likely to stay engaged in care and feel empowered and autonomous over their well-being. Yes. Now, I would like to agree with what you're saying about the shift. Yes. I would like to say that we learn lessons from PrEP, that we learn lessons from U equals U, that, act, that scientists and researchers and doctors have been enlightened about this. <laughs> However, now, as more and more data is coming out about the effectiveness of doxycycline to prevent STIs, I am seeing the same stupid shit play out all over again. again. The same gatekeeping, the same paternalism, the same anti-pleasure message. Well, you slept, just shouldn't be doing what you're doing. So while we have a rise, I mean, we don't even know the stats right now on STIs because of COVID. So much of the data we have about STIs in this country is not really known because people weren't really able to get tested and treated during COVID. But I am sure it is sky high right now. We also have effective medicine to prevent STIs by maybe 70%, maybe more. We're still yeah. learning. UCSF just came out with a whole thing about this. And at the time we're talking, they haven't released the data yet, but right. they're going to in about five weeks. So we'll see. So we're going to really hear it. My sources tell me. And I would trust you. You got your ear to the My ground. sources tell me. Well, and their press release yeah. suggested yeah. that they're finding doxycycline 200 milligrams after, expo after sex is extremely effective Amazing. at reducing STI transmission. So, why are we seeing, again, I ran into the same arguments, the doctors, researchers saying, no, 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 we can't trust that, no, we can't prescribe that, no, we can't support that. And it's then now really up to us again, using social media to talk about this and help people get it and help people connect to pharmacies that will import it internationally. It's like, why do we have to do this again, Alex? Why over and over again? again, I know. Why are we here again? The billion dollar question. If I could only, you know, provide the one piece of information that would undo it all I could. But yeah, you know, and for uh, a little more context, the idea here is taking doxycycline and a common antibiotic after sex and possible STI exposure, mm -hmm. or prophylactically, sort mm -hmm. of in an ongoing fashion, which is, can, what, which is what you do, yeah. can reduce uh, syphilis and chlamydia. And UCSF said gonorrhea. And gonorrhea. So some of the data we have said it's not effective to protect from gonorrhea. Yeah. UCSF said it is. It is. And we're going to have more of those more numbers of those, yeah. very soon, perhaps by the time this is airing. Hopefully, <laughs> I know. Behind. So by the time you're re-watching this, you yeah. will be able to, and I'll even post it once they post it, um, what their final Access that data. data is. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, again, right, we just see this, the it, uh, transposing of the same set of fearful, risk-centered, anti-pleasure politics move along as we develop new technologies, right? And I like to say this. Um, as someone who studies sort of like feminist science studies or feminist studies of health and, and technology is that a new technological innovation, it's hard to know what it's going to do before it's introduced, whether it's going to be accepted or rejected or be used for good or used for bad or all of these things at once. And I think like we see here, even though we've learned or some of us have learned 
uh, about you know pleasure and empowerment through prep, we can f so many of us can forget those same messages with the introduction of a new technology. And I think with the idea that whatever the next step is of of sexual power or sexual promiscuity that this might unlock. That is now too much. Uh oh. I know. <laughs> We're uh -oh. looking at you, Damon. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, you know, I think uh, people are quick to forget and are quick to stay nervous if they can. It's just so fear based. And yeah. again, this is why I'm disappointed and a little skeptical that, he, you know, once again, this, this anti pleasure, fear based model is presenting its head in spite of the data and the science. This is why a lot of us in the movement prefer to say, let's prioritize medicine over morality. Data over dogma, yeah. science over stigma, yeah. your ep, let's prioritize evidence over emotions, because that's how we help people have pleasurable lives, meaningful lives, and reduce the risk of transmitting HIV or STIs. Absolutely. <sighs> <laughs> Lots of work. I'm glad. So I'm glad you're starting in this profession and you have a lot to do to, to, cause I, to keep going. I, I, know. I need you to keep doing what you're doing. So you are 28 years old. I'm 28. Recently, yes. Wow. That's great. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you learn about prep? Yeah. So, you know, I think this was actually, I think prep for me and how I got into it and why I feel so personally invested yeah. in research and activism around this is because I was like, living, you know, a sort of young, gay, sexual life around the time that I heard of it. You know, it was 2015, I'm in college, I'm trying to think of what to do my senior project on, and I see an uh, article in Time on prep, and I'm, I'm blown away. Like, how is this not the front cover? How is this not the whole issue? You know, just some article in it. And I see that it was FDA approved three and a half years before I even read the article. And I was stupefied. I just thought, how could this be the social reality we are living in? Thinking back to the height of the AIDS epidemic and the frenetic life or death politics that sexual health technologies held back then. You know, how could we get to this point where something like this is not being lauded and known about in the entire community mm -hmm. writ large? Um, and that, that got my gears turning and I, I wanted to discover why. And like we talked about, you know, I think uh, for all the reasons we said, that's a really large driving force. Yeah. Um, but most people, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. most people in their early 20s yes. don't think about HIV as a, a risk factor or a serious risk factor to them. Is that, do you think I'm off with that? Maybe. So I think, you know, and this again, when I was uh, sort of like, 2021, this was, you know, about seven, eight years ago. Um, and back then, everyone I, you know, all my gay friends, myself included, we all had HIV scares or knew people who were HIV positive or had it happen. And, you know, I still remember for me, you know, being terrified after having a talk with a provider who told me that my, like, common cold was probably HIV but didn't offer me a test. You know, just, like, terrible experience. Whoa, back up. Back up. I need to hear this. Okay, tell, tell yeah, me. Yeah, it was uh, after finals. I think I just got run down from pulling an all-nighter to, I wanted to make sure I didn't have strep throat, you know. The university provider who was on call told me, you know, it was likely HIV infection or could be or we wouldn't want to rule it out. Did not offer me a test. You know, I can hardly sleep. I'm so worried. I walk my feverish body to the Walgreens at 4 a.m. to get a rapid and, you know, and, and there's just that level of, uh, of fear and of uh, sort of like a constant self surveillance around someone's status. But I, I still wasn't feeling ready to, to start prep or to take it because it still felt so foreign and uh, inaccessible, you know? So even young folks who I think do think about HIV or do think about their sexual health status or try and empower and educate themselves and have conversations, it can still be really difficult to uh, seek care, um, especially when you've had really bad experiences. So this is a doctor who told you over the phone, just based on your symptoms. Almost worse, in person, in but then person, didn't offer. Didn't test you, just yeah. said you probably have a could We can't rule it out, we, this very well might be, yeah, exactly, so. Jesus, yeah. all right. So how in the so I can definitely see how that could lead to a sense of mistrust yeah. of healthcare professionals. Absolutely. Because that let's just be clear, people may not understand why that's inappropriate. 
to speculate that someone might have HIV without giving them a test right. is not only unethical, it is actually dangerous because there are some people that would use that information to possibly hurt themselves. Hurt themselves yeah. And you really cannot do that in HIV testing. You want to always do safety checks first. Absolutely. And, and be really clear if the, you know, if the, if the result was positive, would you be at risk for hurting yourself? Yeah. Because and, of all that people are. And a whole a whole laundry list of best practices around around providing testing or information. Yeah, absolutely. This was here in New York City? This one is uh, back at Yale in New Haven. New Haven? Yeah, it's good. One of the gayest schools I've ever seen, too. So I don't know uh, who they're hiring, but... Yeah. So how did you finally decide to start using PrEP for yeah. yourself? Yeah, great question. You know, somehow, even when I was studying it for so long, I still didn't really view it as for me. Um, and then I think one day I woke up and I really sat with, you know, as I was trying to critically dissect the problems that were out there in, you know, in, in public health writ large and the country writ large, I started to think, wait, what are the problems within me? And I say problem, not judgmentally, but more... What is in my way that makes me think that I can't or shouldn't take this? Mm. And I started to think, you know, apply those same critical uh, tools that I used to look at other people and other systems to myself. And I realized that a lot of this is shame. A lot of this is fear. A lot of this... Fear of what? Fear of what? I don't even know. I can't even tell. I think fear that I would have to recognize myself as a full sexual person recognize myself as a gay man who has sex that can, you know, put you at certain types of risk. And that part of maintaining my, my sexual autonomy was to own up to that and, and engage with it. You know, and I think there is a little bit of fear in embracing that with taking something every day and having to incorporate that into my conception of myself. And I think I finally got there. And I, you know, over the years, I made a small career out of it. Not as, not as large as yours, but in encouraging other people to tackle shame and fear in themselves and to make them feel more agential in figuring out the sexual lives that are right for them. Wow. Great. Yeah. So a lot of real thinking and like the way you think about yourself had to be considered in that process. Yeah. I think a lot of people forget that. Yeah. That, you know, we're talking about taking a pill to prevent HIV, which by itself, it, it's proactive. Right. Which in and of itself is inherent of affirming one's sexual, like, sexuality. Like, that was the thing that blew my mind when I started using it. I take this pill every day because I'm affirming I'm a sexual person. It doesn't mean I'm getting fucked every day. But it just means that I take a pill every day so I can if I choose to. And that was... An identity as well. Yeah. I mean, that was something that I had to really say, oh, this is what I'm doing. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I definitely saw through prep facts. I'm sure, you know, we've just seen through queer community over the years. And, and as I sort of found through my research and other great research that people have published, prep really is, and I think sexual technologies and sexual health care increasingly are incorporated into a sense of identity, into a sort of durable idea of self that stays with you. Mm -hmm. And identity processes like that can be very stressful or can challenge your notion of yourself, can bring up a lot of emotions, and it's difficult. And so I think, you know, what we see is the, the biggest success stories, whether it be PrEP or whether it be starting HIV treatment, whether it be going in for three-site testing, mm -hmm. come from when people are able to incorporate those things into their sense of self in a healthy and authentic way. Yeah. So given that, based on your experience, based on your research, what accounts for so many of the disparities and low uptake of PrEP? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, the typical uh, go-to factors, you know, I think a uh, healthcare system that is difficult to navigate, inaccessible and inequitable, histories of medical racism, uh, like we said, queer phobia, sex shaming, providers who aren't comfortable, a lot of the usual sort of uh, sort of boogeyman when it comes to disparities. And, and what you described earlier, that very horrible experience with a doctor who was so inappropriate with you, right. I often am hearing is so common yeah. among people of color, especially Absolutely. in the South. Like that is more the norm. Absolutely. You know, I think, especially nowadays, what, we're, what we've seen for the past few years is a lot of well-resourced folks, well-resourced queer people who tend to be white, who tend to be more educated, who tend to live in more urban areas, 
are really starting to able to access PrEP writ large, while a lot of people of color are still finding it very difficult due, like you said, to medical racism, to uh, disparities in resources and access and insurance and education, and affirming providers and also people within their communities who are able to uh, provide more culturally competent care. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think uh, something that uh, still sticks out to me a lot is last year in 2021, we have a new federal mandate mm -hmm. that PrEP and all of the healthcare costs and uh, prescription costs associated with it need to be covered in full by almost all insurance plans in the country, uh, which is a fact that most people are, aren't aware of, right. um, either on the provider or patient side. And I think the level of technicality we see around this um, requires just a level of time and knowledge of the healthcare system that most average people don't have, right? Like, I have gone in to try and manage my own prescriptions for PrEP or other things, and I'm like, I am getting a PhD in public health, and this still makes me want to pull my hair out. So, you know, beyond a certain point, people don't have the resources or the energy to, uh, to keep fighting the insurance companies, to keep fighting the specialty pharmacies, right. to keep managing logistics, and, and uh, I think there's a lot of barriers still. Their system. Right. Even though it is mandated in the U.S. that PrEP be accessible in insurance companies, a lot of the um, insurance companies are still charging. Right. And if you push back, they'll they'll back down. They'll back down. And a lot of people don't know that. Right. And, and you know, you talk to someone on the phone, and it's not their job. You go to the right. manager, but they're, it's not their job. Right. You know, you have to go through this whole process just to get it. Yeah. So. And that's for people with insurance. Yeah. So if you don't have insurance and you're not in a state with Medicaid. Medicaid expansion, right? Uh, then this is where I'm hearing there's really, really a lot of problems. Yeah. So Gilead, um, you know, as part of their sort of expanded advancing access program, has routes to access free or uh, sort of cost shared prep mm -hmm. um, that makes it more accessible. But again, this requires, for most of the time, a lot of knowledge on the part of the patient mm -hmm. and or sort of a full care team that is able to sign you up, manage the copay cards, right? Like kind of uh, handle this complex uh, network of healthcare billing and benefits for you. And that is uh, not the type of care that our system prioritizes. Right, and even once you've done that, you get the drug, the drug is free, it's the wraparound services. Right. If you don't have insurance, the wraparound meaning HIV testing, STI, three site testing. Testing, getting blood work um, done. If you don't live in an area where that's really free and accessible, or if you're in an area where the only place you can do that is the clinic that has the big AIDS sign outside, it's like AIDS Inc. Come yeah. on in. You don't have to be positive to get your butt swabbed here. Right. But if that's the only place that does butt swabbing in your community, and everyone's going to know your business if you walk in there. And there's a high amount of social risk, yeah. that we like to call it, in, uh, in sort of social studies. Yeah, yeah. To, uh, to going in, into that place, to being seen by members in the community, absolutely. So even once we get past the sort of insurance and the political economy of accessing the meds, then all of the other barriers uh, start to come into. Yeah. yeah. You also, in your work, are very aware of disparities in terms of access for transgender individuals yeah. in healthcare and PrEP. Tell me more about that. What are you seeing? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the other uh, great things we've seen slowly start to grow, you know, over the past five, seven years is uh, recognizing the importance of providing comprehensive sexual health services, including PrEP, to folks across gender and sexual identities and experiences, to transgender people who don't fit the, the sort of normative standard of how people are used to prescribing and thinking about sex or sexual risk. Um, so a lot of fantastic activists, a lot of really forward-thinking public health campaigns that have centered, centered excuse me, trans folks and trans experience have, uh, I think, made it more on the horizon and more accessible for trans folks. But we're still seeing a lot of disparities, um, you know, transgender women, transgender men, non-binary people um, can still find it very difficult to uh, find providers who are able to not only meet them where they're at sexually, but also meet them where they're at on their gender journey and their gender identity. And uh, although the sort of new standard is to try and provide sexual health services and gender affirming care in one, uh, in one go, you know, to make it easier for patients, that's a standard that, again, our system doesn't prioritize and that a lot of providers throughout the country, especially outside of urban areas, 
uh, aren't able to provide themselves, unfortunately. Do you see any hope there? Do you see that changing in the areas where that's not accessible? Gender yeah. sensitive care is not accessible or is that? <sighs> yeah, you know, I want to say yes and I want to say no. I think mm -hmm. in many ways, like we said, there's uh, a rise in consciousness around uh, gender and sexual diversity and in sort of breaking down the normative assumptions that go into a clinical encounter for someone to get sexual health or gender affirming care. At the same time that we've seen an absolute resurgence and almost uh, outgrowth of anti-transgender politics and policies and rhetoric um, and really restrictive bills throughout the country. And I mean, when Trump was elected, you know, we had the uh, federal order that said that healthcare providers or companies don't need to provide gender affirming care, for yeah. example. So there really is a legal and ideological onslaught, I think, against transgender dignity and well being, even outside of gender and sexuality right now. Wow. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So earlier you mentioned the uh, last year, the, the ending the epidemic mm -hmm. protocol came out. Let's just say at some point, the Biden cabinet of ending HIV says, you know, Alex, we love your work and we really are interested in your ideas. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What, what in your opinion, could we be doing better to end the epidemic by 23? Wow. Well, finally, someone gave me the platform that I've always needed yes. and deserved. Thank goodness. Yes. Absolutely. You know, I think um, for me, and this is maybe a little uh, anticlimactic, I think a lot of the biggest things that could be done are not even necessarily proper HIV specific, right? Mm -hmm. I think having national insurance that is uh, largely accessible, relieving student debt, and uh, removing that financial burden. You know, I see uh, just these other structural factors that orbit. Um, I think healthcare and sexual health, even before I see the issue itself. Yeah. But if we're to target in on specific planning, I think having higher compliance with free prep throughout insurance companies, making sure that there are uh, sort of state programs in place to facilitate access throughout the country. We've seen in New York um, just a really robust healthcare machinery for providing information, for finding providers, both in New York City and in New York State, yeah. which is a very different uh, political and geographic and economic context. So we see that success upstate too. I think that sort of um, investment in our populations in each state uh, would be one of the first things I would want to tackle. Wow, okay, you know, and, and I appreciate, I hadn't really thought of it from the point of view of student debt before. Yeah. Um, so thank you for yeah, you know, that we, we think about young people, we think about making priorities, we think about, you know, having to go to work or being afraid of what something's going to cost and how that can feel prohibitive, you know. A lot of the uh, factors that, you know, adjust how people make choices throughout their lives are uh, larger than just one issue. Yeah. And housing. And housing. That's the other thing access to housing. that I think about Absolutely. in terms of, you know, again, if they you can't... I feel like that sometimes their plans are so focused on HIV and PrEP and U equals yeah. U, and they don't think about student debt or housing or some of these other issues. Yes. And I think that's yeah. one of the reasons, you know, I've uh, shifted my research focus broadly towards a lot of other topics in some the past few years. Yeah. What's the, where are you shifting? Where yeah, you well, you know, one of the, one of the matters of this, I've, uh, it was partially me getting a little frustrated and almost tired even with some of the HIV research world um, or activist world, because, yeah. you know, I think people love to target the most specific, specific intervention or sort of specific type of uh, um, financial investment that could be made only to rediscover the wheel for us to, you know, we've, been, we've known for decades that we could give people housing and it would, you know, help them across so many parts of their life. We know that people who experience racial stigma and economic disenfranchisement have worse health outcomes. You know, we know these things, but uh, sometimes I think the research and uh, sort of wheel just kind of keeps turning in the same, in the same sort of rut. Um, but I think over the past few years, you know, I've, uh, I've been looking more at how biological research on the same-sex sexual behavior, like gay gene research in its newest iteration, um, as well as research on biological sex, how these scientific studies and the ideas they produce um, are sort of traveling throughout law, 
throughout public opinion, throughout journalist media, and sort of how they're uh, configuring our current ideas about what it means to be a gender or sexually diverse person. Wow. Okay. So, you know, I was going to ask you, and you may have already said this, or just said it, but like, what, if anything, gives you a sense of hope at this moment for our future, for this country, for pleasure? Yeah. You know, I think... Um, it's almost maybe counterintuitive, but the dire straits that such large laws of the country have found themselves in between COVID, between heightened inflation and wealth disparity, and the fever pitch of alt-right white nationalism, you know, I think there's a lot of social scientists and studies of countries throughout history that note how when the tides kind of rise this high, we can also use that as a rallying moment for uh, people who have been oppressed to fight back and to kind of continue to create new political consciousness. So I think this sort of, although we're facing more in some ways than we ever have before, I think that can also radicalize people. And I think we should all be focusing on inviting people into the collective struggle. Awesome. That's good to hear. I like that. And I do think history shows that, yeah. you know, that when the shit gets really bad, there is enough collective energy to fight back on that, that we haven't really experienced in our lifetimes, but this country has experienced and, you know, felt like a hundred years ago. Absolutely. Very similar stuff going on that we're yeah. just sort of, again, maybe reinventing the wheel yeah. over and over. How many times? <laughs> but, you know. But any, uh, any yeah. bad piece of news can also be a, uh, um, you know, a rallying cry or a moment of uh, activation of our social networks yeah. or our political consciousness. Do you feel there is greater um, negativity or contempt towards academia right now? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think in some ways, yes, in as much as, you know, with the rise of sort of uh, anti-truth movements yeah. throughout the country, you know, we see sort of um, expert knowledge coming into question more than ever before, um, as well as I think really well-grounded skepticisms and critiques of the inaccessibility of academia and scientific knowledge, mm -hmm. of the sort of elite vested interests of many of the people there. Um, but at the same time, I think academia and scientific research is almost more disempowered than before, and also more important. You know, universities are increasingly just hedge funds with adjuncted, you know, schools attached. Yeah. Um, and I think that the people who bear the largest brunt of that fake austerity are intellectuals and scholars of color, are queer researchers and trans researchers, are people on the margins. And so those types of knowledges are also under threat. Um, and simultaneously, I think as we you know, even as we come to an era where expert knowledge is mistrusted by many more than ever before, we're also facing problems that require specialized knowledge more than ever before. Mm. With environmental devastation, with increasingly complex economic systems, with COVID and the rise of uh, um, sort of more knowledge around sexual health and epidemiology, we're also looking towards expert academic knowledge. Uh, more than the past in some ways. So it's sort of that double-edged sword, you know? I know. Nothing is ever as simple as, uh, you know, A or B or black or white. But. Fascinating. Wow. Okay. I think, well, I want to thank you for this. Yes. yes. Oh I, I, I think you're the youngest person I've interviewed in this tub. I, I as, it wrong, but I, as the young people in their younger 20s start to ostracize me in my late 20s, I appreciate the, uh, that, that perspective. Thank you. Very well, much. and that was, I always wanted this experience to be one of diverse people and ages and experience and, and perspectives in life. Absolutely. Uh, but and that's why I was so glad to like, get an invite so to the thank tub. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> Is there anything I haven't asked you? that you would like to share or thoughts or reflections or insights you would want to make sure the world knows or hears about today? Nothing too broad other than uh, I hope everyone has a happy pride if this there's afterwards, and if not, everyone continues to have a happy pride, uh -huh. and to uh, figure out how you can get involved in your political realm. Great. Yes, to, to vote. We make sure to you vote. are registered to vote. Okay. And that pride can be, you know, I'm not a big, huge proponent of, like, pride, pride. per se. I don't really do pride. I believe in living life fully, fully. and meaningfully and pleasurefully and playfully all, all the year, year round. Exactly. 
I don't need a parade to do it. It's just the world I live in. Right. May uh, may your pride and the the politics and the pleasure associated with it be with you all year round. Oh, that I love that. Right. All right. Thank you so much. If people want to follow your work, see you more, read more of your research, what's the best way for them to do that? Absolutely. So I am on Instagram as a at Angus Bangus, um, which I'll type up for you. Uh -huh. um, I recently joined TikTok um, as the sexpert, the underscore sexpert. Um, okay. So all those links will be right. All those links will be here. Yeah. And uh, if you want to find some of my research, you can reach out to me through those platforms, email me, um, I'll put the email down below, or go on to Google Scholar and type Alexandra Borsa. Oh, ooh. all right. She's a scholar, that. Henny, absolutely. And if you like this episode, subscribe. If you don't like it, subscribe right. anyway, and then make somebody you don't like watch it, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how this works. Anyways, thank you, everybody. Thank you for watching Tub Talks. Enjoy your day.